Oh, now we're good. Now does that work? Okay, all right. Well, I won't touch it, touch it again. I'll be careful uh, not to do that there. But uh, anyway, I appreciate uh, Brother Allison's message. And uh, as an evangelist, uh, I, about every week when I'm out in meetings, at some point I'm going to preach about the cross. And uh, Jesus, keep me near the cross. And I appreciated the music tonight as it pointed us to that. Pastor, thank you for letting the ladies trio be here from Ambassador. Uh, at Ambassador Baptist College, we're looking for the next generation of preachers, uh, Christian school teachers, missionaries, evangelists, uh, preachers of the gospel of all sorts. That's what we're looking for. We believe that there is a greater need in this country tonight for Bible preachers than ever before. Uh, every week at Ambassador, we get calls from churches all over this country. And they're not looking for a building payment. They're not looking for a youth program. They're looking for a pastor. And uh, I want to encourage every young man in this room, listen to me. I understand. Uh, some people think that I, I say, I think that every young man ought to be a preacher. Listen, I realize that men cannot be mama called and daddy sent. All right? If everybody was called to be a preacher, I'd have nobody to preach to. I get it. But I'm going to tell you, for every young man here, you ought to be willing you ought to have a heart of submission like Brother Allison preached about tonight. And I'm convinced that God is calling just as much as He ever has, but we're not listening. And uh, too many of our young people, and the truth is, really as adults we are as well, we're intoxicated with the American dream. You know, you make a fine living and uh, you have... Listen... Uh, you, have to throw, you have to throw all that out the window because there's nothing that will satisfy you like doing the will of God. And uh, so stop by the table after the service, grab some information about Ambassador, and uh, you can take a prayer card. Remember to pray for us as we train God's servants for God's service. There are several books that are authored by our, uh, ch our chancellor, our founder, Ron Comfort. A Fire in My Bones is a wonderful biography or autobiography. Uh, he's written out his life story. If you've ever heard Ron Comfort preach, you'll hear in his messages, he talks about his childhood. He talks about being saved. He talks about uh, so many aspects of his life as a Christian, how God worked. Well, that book is a great chronicle of that, and it's really a story of the grace of God. Another book that he's authored entitled Last Things. It's on uh, Bible prophecy. You know what I've learned since COVID? Since COVID, I've had more people who just know that I'm a preacher, whether they're in church or lost, say, do you think Jesus is coming again? Do you think the world is about to end? And uh, I don't know their motivations and ask me those questions, but I'm going to take advantage of it and uh, point them to the Lord. And so anyway, it's a great, uh, great themes uh, on Bible prophecy. And so ladies, thank you. You're sounding better all the time. Now, Brother, Sh Brother Schmidt's not, but you all are. And uh, I appreciate Tim and Megan, two of our graduates. Tim's an evangelist based out of California. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. I tip my hat to any pastor or any evangelist in California. Uh, I'm telling you, sometimes they're subjected to greater hostilities. They see things that uh, don't trickle to the East Coast for another four or five years. And they're on the front lines. And I uh, appreciate the work that they're doing for the Lord. Joshua chapter 2, I hope I've given you time to find it tonight. If not, let me help you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Joshua is a long ways before that, all right? <laughs> Joshua chapter 2, I want to begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And when they came into the harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there, and it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out, and the, whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. 
But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. And that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came up out of Egypt, and what ye did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house and to give me a true token and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And what we've just read in the first 13 verses of chapter 2 is an introduction to a lesser known character in the Old Testament, her name Rahab. And I think tonight, if I could sum up Rahab's life in one simple phrase, I would say it very simply this way, that she was taken from rags to riches. Have you ever heard that terminology used before? I remember several years ago in North Carolina when lotteries and gambling was illegal. It's a gr having a growing foothold in North Carolina. But I remember that there were people in North Carolina that would drive across the border into South Carolina to play the lottery. Now, lest you think that this illustration is an endorsement of the lottery, let me tell you something. There's no worse way to lose your money and to just waste it than to gamble it away. The Bible makes it clear that the love of money is the root of all evil. You show me an industry that thrives on the love of money and I'll show you something that destroys families and destroys society. But nonetheless, this family played the lottery and they won $60 million. This was probably 20 years ago. And in the Charlotte Observer, which is a liberal rag... Uh, they wrote an article and they were highlighting this family and they talked about how this family was typically blue collar. They were rather obscure. They were not well known to everyone and now all of a sudden, $60 million later, I mean, they have been raised in the limelight. And the Charlotte Observer gave the idea, here was a family that was taken from rags to riches via the lottery. And I remember reading that and shaking my head. But I'm here to tell you tonight that the people who are truly taken from rags to riches are those individuals that place their faith in Jesus Christ, have their sins washed away, and an eternity in heaven. And I want to take you back to this Old Testament story, and I want to show you how God reached down and transformed the life of a woman who was hopeless without God and would eventually do things in her life that she would have never imagined. And I'll tell you tonight, if anybody was taken from rags to riches, Rahab was that one. So this evening, listen carefully as I take you briefly through her life and as I tell you how she was taken from rags to riches. Number one, I want you to see her conversion. Now, we predominantly know from both this passage and at least two other passages in the New Testament that Rahab had a past that was marred with immorality. It's very plain in the Scripture. And what happens is sometimes you and I are more prone to remember Rahab because of her awful past regardless of the work that God did in her heart. And that's unfortunate. 
Because I want you to understand that the beginning point for Rahab came, I believe, in Joshua chapter 2 or shortly before when she heard about what God had done with Israel. And I believe that we find her at this point as a new believer in Jehovah God. I mean, did you not hear it when she said in verses 11 and 12, she said, for the Lord, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above. That was a mouthful for a pagan. Here was a woman, listen, she had been raised apart from God, didn't believe in Jehovah as being the true and living God, and after hearing all that she did, she makes that confession. She said, your God, he's the God in heaven and earth. And I believe we find her at these very beginning stages where she places her faith in God and her life has changed. Now, some people may object to that. There's some of you say, well, I don't know if I, how I feel about that, Brother Beal. Well, can I tell you the New Testament, I think, makes it very plain what happened in Rahab's life. The reason I say that is because in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, which is the hall of faith. Do you remember that? By faith, you've got Abraham and others. I mean, these were people that followed God. And in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 31... The Bible says, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. I believe that the writer of Hebrews gives us a very clear testimony. I mean, listen, if Rahab was never saved, at least admit she's the only unsaved person in Hebrews chapter 11 who's honored. But the writer of Hebrews makes this very plain <clears throat> that she perished not with them that believe not. That entire city was given to idolatry and paganism but there was one thing different about Rahab. Here's what it was she believed. Let me tell you, there are two types of people in this room tonight. You say tall and short. You say skinny and those who wish they were skinny. <coughs> no, I'll tell you the two types of people that are in this room, those that believe and those that believe not. And I'm talking about Jesus Christ tonight. We heard a message on the cross. Jesus Christ was lifted up and it was made obvious to all of us that he died for you. I know that Rahab had a checkered past, but I thank God that she was able to see that God, the God of the universe, the God of the Bible is the God that she needed to worship and she placed her faith in Him. James chapter 2 and verse 25. The Bible says, Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way? You come to the book of James, often it's a controversial book. People tell me, I've never read it for myself, but Martin Luther, he didn't like the book of James. He thought it taught a work salvation. And sometimes you read James chapter 2, verse 25, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works. You say, well, that sounds pretty plain to me that he's teaching a work salvation. But when you read the context of that chapter, you know what James is teaching? When you read all that he's saying in James chapter 2, he's not saying that you get salvation by works, but he says this, you have a salvation that works. There's some people that shy away from that, but I'm just telling you, he says, how do we know that Rahab, a difference was made in her life? I'm going to tell you, when she hid those spies, that was evidence that something had changed in her life. Now, before I go any further this evening, my friend, you better make sure that you classify that you're in the, the class of believe or believe not. And my friend, if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, this is the night for you to get into the camp of those who believe. You know, Jesus was talking to a religious crowd and he told them, he said, you know what, it's easier for the harlots and the publicans to go into the kingdom of God than you. 
And Jesus said that because he said, you know what, the harlots and the publicans, listen, those people who are the off-scouring of society, they know what they are and they know that they have a need. You don't have to convince them all day long that they need something greater than themselves because they're in a bad place. But for the religious crowd, they were so blinded. And Jesus said, I'm telling you, those who are bad off are going to go before you. And you know what? There have been people blinded by booze. There have been people blinded by immorality. But I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people in the Bible Belt, they've been blinded by religion. You go to a place all of your life. You've sat in a church pew. You've tried to do the best you can. Better for a person whose life has been dashed on the rocks of sin to wake up in the middle of their lives and come to know Christ as Savior and to be saved than for somebody to sit in a church pew all of their lives and be moral and die and go to hell. It's just that simple. You see our conversion. But the second thing that I want to point out to you tonight is her challenge. You know, if Brother Savage knew that I was going to be preaching, I told him, I said, listen, I want you to tell your congregation that I'm going to preach about a Bible character on Tuesday night that's going to challenge all of us. And some of you speculate before the service tonight, you were out in the parking lot with your spouses or friends, and somebody says, I'll tell you what, I bet he's going to preach on the Apostle Paul. Maybe somebody else said, no, I'll tell you, it's probably Moses. Somebody else would say, no, I think it's Peter. I mean, Pentecost, that was a big deal. I don't think there's a single one of you that has sat out there in that parking lot and said, I know who he's preaching about, Rahab. Because it's a character that we really just, we don't even think twice about it. But this woman's life was a great challenge to two groups of people. And let me highlight who they were and why. Her life at this point was a great challenge to every Canaanite that was in Jericho. I believe that all of them heard the same thing she did. Now, Pastor Allison and Brother Savage can attest to this. Now, I'm going to give you a preacher's secret. All right? We don't often divulge these, but here's the secret that I want to share with all of you this evening. Did you know that when we preach, we preachers can actually see what people are doing? It's absolutely incredible. Some people are oblivious to that fact. Listen, I can preach and I can tell where somebody's got a medicinal sleep because they didn't take their insulin shot or they're just flat out bored. You, just, you, you learn how to identify it. But you know what is amazing to me? And these preachers can testify to it. You can be preaching a message and see in the same message two polar opposite reactions. Man, I'm going to tell you what, I've been preaching sometimes and you can see a young man who's on the edge of his seat. I'm telling you, he's about to fall over. He's with you with every word. And you see another one who's made his bed and he's laying in it. Do you know what Israel or what, uh, what those Canaanites knew at this point? Rahab tells us, she said, hey, we heard about the Red Sea. She said, we heard about those Egyptians and we even heard about when you whipped those two kings. Now here's the difference. Here's one woman that heard about what God did and she said, I believe and everybody else said, "Uh uh-uh. Two totally different reactions to the same messages. But her life was not only a challenge to every Canaanite, let me tell you, her life was a challenge to every Israelite. Now I'm going to tell you how. Rahab didn't have a Bethel Baptist church in Jericho with a man like Pastor Savage thundering, thus saith the Lord. She didn't have some prophet walking up and down the walls saying, here's the Bible, this is what God has to say. I think it's fairly safe to say it this way. Rahab had very little light. But here's the challenge, she did a lot with it. Brother 
Brother Allison referred to us talking about being in the Bible Belt. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? I'm going to tell you what, we've got a lot to be accountable for. Listen, even in our churches, we have a lot of light, but we do little with it. I may be talking to some of you here. You say, preacher, I'm going to tell you what, I've taken the Bible for granted outside of these church services. I'm not really in the Word of God. Or maybe even when you sit in church, you say, preacher, I'll just be honest, sometimes I'm bored. Well, I can tell you it's not for lack of content and it's not for lack of excitement in delivery, but it very well may be because of a coldness that's in your heart. But I'm telling you to whom much is given, much will be required. And it may be that here we find, if I could say it this way, a new Christian in the Old Testament who has a greater hunger for light and a greater desire to obey it than some people who've been saved for many years. I wonder if Rahab has a lot more hunger and obedience with the little light that she has than for some of us who have heard it over and over and over and over again. Not only do you see her conversion, not only do you see her challenge, but I want you to see next of all, I want you to see her courage. What does this woman do? The spies come to her door and listen to me, she takes them in. I don't think we understand what just happens here. I mean, the enemy has come to her house and she lets them in and she is going to aid them and she is going to hide them. You say, that woman was crazy. No, I'm going to tell you, she was courageous. Now, let me just deal with something right now. There's some people that get so bent out of shape and, they, and all they focus on, they say, well, Rahab lied about keeping them. You say, well, preacher, how do you answer that? I'm going to tell you how I answer it. I just try to answer it the way the Bible does. You know, I, I never one time read that God commended her for her lie. I, I don't see that, but I will tell you this. In Hebrews chapter 11, God commends her. It's by faith she received the spies. Now, God said that. You say, well, I have a problem. Well, take it up with him. What When she received those spies, it was a display of faith on her part. She believed God. She took these spies in. I'm not telling you that God blessed her lie, but I do know this. The Bible makes it plain that he blessed her faith. There's no doubt about it. But here's the thing I want you to see. Her faith motivated her to be courageous. You know, there were no Christian, Christianity anonymous cliques in Jericho that gathered together and said, oh, there's just 10 of us and let's all gather together and give ourselves a good pep rally talk and let's go out there and serve God. There was none of that. She was alone. You say, well, what difference does that make? I'm going to tell you what difference it makes. There may be some of you and you're in a workplace and you feel like everybody else is against Christianity or you feel like there's just not many people that are sympathetic to your beliefs. I'm going to tell you something. If Rahab could be courageous in Jericho, you better mark it down. You can be courageous in Jackson, Tennessee. You say, it's hard. I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm just saying that when you have faith in God, you'll rise above it and you'll obey Him. There are some of you tonight, maybe your witness has waned and you have lost courage. I believe there's a direct correlation between your courage and your faith. Because when you believe God, then you'll step out and you'll do His bidding. And I may be speaking to some of us tonight. We've lost our courage in the workplace. We've lost our courage in society. Why? Because we've focused on the scorners instead of focusing on God. Let me tell you something. If Rahab would have directed her attention to the king of Jericho and all that was being said about Israel 
And Jehovah God, she would have never let those spies in, but she was driven by courage. She didn't spare them out of convenience. It wasn't the easy thing to do. It wasn't the safe thing to do. Her faith motivated her to risk her life. And sometimes in America, Christianity, our faith can't even motivate us to get off the couch. Let me ask you, when's the last time your faith motivated you to do something for God? She was courageous. But not only do you see her courage, I also want you to see her curse. You say her curse. What's Rahab's curse? I find it interesting that both in Joshua chapter 2 and then in Hebrews chapter 11, in Joshua, or excuse me, in James chapter 2, there are two words attached to her name. The harlot. And those are the two words that we remember more than anything else. And that's how many of us have marked her. You might say, well, why do you think, Brother Beal, that in the New Testament, in Hebrews of all books, by faith, Why does God put that in there? Why does James refer to her by her former occupation? Now, I'll admit, uh, what I'm about to give you is probably a little bit of speculation. I know when we get to heaven, we can ask God personally. But I don't believe that God put that in there to kick Rahab and to make light of her because of her past. By the time I get to the end of the message, you'll see why I believe that way about her. But I don't think that was God's way of kicking Rahab and saying, yep, that's like the unpardonable thing and uh, I'm not forgiving you of that. No, that's not why God allowed that to be left there. You know why I believe God allowed those two words to be attached to her name in the New Testament? To remind every person in this room this evening that the choices that you make have consequences. You can take your life and live it a certain way and be known by that for the rest of your life, even though maybe you've gotten saved. And there's some of you in this room this evening, you say, Preacher, before I got saved, I did some awful things. All right, and listen to me. I'm not preaching for the next five minutes to dwell on your past, but if you could join me and help me impress upon a younger generation that hasn't made those mistakes to stay away from it and to don't make the same mistakes you did. There are some of you this evening, listen, you may be on the verge of making something, a decision that will mar your testimony and that will ruin your effectiveness for God. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find, yes, God forgives, but I'm telling you, man's got a long memory and oftentimes we're defined by the decisions that we make. Don't lose sight of that. I remember as a kid growing up, Uh, there was a baseball team that was doing very well called the New York Mets. I became a fan of theirs in the 80s. And I'll never forget watching the 1986 World Series. I was a 12-year-old kid. I was sitting in the living room floor. It was game six. They were playing the Boston Red Sox. And I still remember sitting on the floor and it was like towards the end of the game and the Red Sox had already won three games, the Mets had won two and it's towards the end of the game and the Red Sox are about to win their fourth game, that means they win the World Series. And I sat in the living room, I was dejected, I was upset. My team was one out away from losing and going home. And there was a guy for the New York Mets who stepped into the batter's box. He was an outfielder. His name was Mookie Wilson. That's quite the name, isn't it? That can't be his real name, but that's what they called him. And it disgusted me because this man was not a great hitter. He was a really charismatic fellow, but that doesn't help you hit the ball better. 
And there was a pitcher, his last name was Stanley for the Red Sox. And long story short, he pitches the ball to Mookie Wilson and Mookie Wilson hits a slow grounder to a bow-legged first baseman named Bill Buckner. Bill Buckner was the first baseman for the Boston Red Sox. It should have been field the ball, touch first base, the game's over. I will never forget watching that ball go through Bill Buckner's legs out into right field. And because of that error, the New York Mets won game six and then they won game seven and the Red Sox lost. Now some of you are like, why are you tell me a baseball story? Some of you ladies are like, I hate baseball. My wife hated baseball for the first 20 years of our marriage. Now she likes to actually watch it. But here's the reason I tell you that story. Bill Buckner was for the majority of his career, he was a very defensive, uh, he had defensive awards for baseball. He was, he was a very good baseball player. This happened later on in his career. And do you know what? The fans of Boston never forgave Bill Buckner because he made a mistake when they were one out away from winning the World Series. He was the subject of jokes that were very ruthless. A little kid came up to me one day. He said, hey, Brother Bill, he said, did you hear that Bill Buckner tried to take his life? I said, no, really? He said, yeah, he jumped in front of a bus, but don't worry, it went between his legs. I was like, ooh, that's, that's awful. You know what? Bill Buckner made one mistake, and it didn't matter how he had played for the first 10 years of his career. He was defying the rest of it by that one mistake. And let me tell you something. If you're in here tonight and you're a Christian brother and the thought of foolishness is in your mind, I'm telling you, you're about ready to throw it all away. I think that title was attached to her name. It wasn't to kick Rahab, but it was maybe to kick some of us tonight and say, hey, you better be careful about the decisions you make. But not only do you see her curse, I want you to also see her concern. Now it's interesting, at the end of this passage, Rahab makes a request and she tells those spies, she said, would you please save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and all that they have. Somehow, some way, Rahab knew judgment was coming. Rahab knew that that city was going to be leveled and with that in mind, Rahab does not ask, Lord, help my savings account, make sure I withdraw everything from the bank, make sure that my chariots don't get ruined. You know what she said? I think she in essence said, there's one thing that matters to me and she said, that's my family. What am I saying? I'm saying that Rahab had a concern for her loved ones and she wanted them to be spared. I'm afraid tonight that this new believer in Joshua chapter 2 perhaps had a greater concern for her loved ones than some of us tonight. When's the last time you've prayed for a mother or a father or an aunt or an uncle or a cousin or a family member or a co-worker to be saved? We get concerned about things a lot. Maybe some of you in recent days have been watching the stock market and you've seen it fluctuate. You've been thinking about your retirement account. You say, well, should I not do that? Well, listen, I, I, brother, I'm just going to tell you, who knows what the next year is going to be like. It's probably going to be a roller coaster. Just buckle up. But here's what I'm saying. If you pay more attention to the stock market than you do the souls of your loved ones, you're misguided. She had such a concern that she says, please, I want them to be spared. And yet, when's the last time we've thought about those that are around us that are heading to judgment? Listen to me. Judgment is certain. 
as it is appointed unto man once to die after this the judgment. And yet we're unconcerned. This new believer had more of a concern for her loved ones than maybe some of us who've been saved for 20 years. We ought to hang our heads in shame. Several years ago, I was staying in a prophet's chamber in Newburn, North Carolina. It was uh, owned by the church, but it wasn't right beside the church, and so therefore you, couldn't have, you wouldn't have thought it to be a part of church property. And my wife and I were in there, and we were doing something. My wife looked out the window, and she said, Oh, look, honey. And I looked, and there were two guys wearing white shirts, black pants with badges and bicycles. And they were coming our way. And my wife said, honey, I think they're coming here to the house. I said, good. And as I was going to the door, she gave me that look of like, be nice. She wasn't telling me to bid them Godspeed, but she was like, don't bust a gasket, you know. And I stepped out on the porch and here are these two Mormons. They stood on the doorstep and they greeted me and I greeted them. This was elder so-and-so and elder so-and-so. And let me just tell you, anytime you have a group like that of two, usually there's a guy who really knows his stuff and then there's another one, he's a trainee. Now this is just practical advice, but I have made up my mind, once I figure out who the rookie is, that's who I want to lay into. I don't want to lay the wood into the, the trainer because he just, he's, he's probably a lost cause. And so, boy, this one guy, he's starting to talk. It becomes very obvious to me. This is a guy who's in the driver's seat for them, and he's telling me all about their beliefs and such. And I didn't say, I'm a Baptist preacher. Blah. I just sat there and listened for a while. And after a while, I said, you know, I said, could I, say, could I ask this other fellow a question? He's hardly said a word. He said, oh, please do. Go ahead. And I looked at that fellow, and I said, young man, I said, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? And boy, he started stuttering and stammering, and so I just started preaching the gospel. And after about a minute of that, the man said, you know what, it's time for us to leave. I said, well, wait a second, I'm not done yet. He said, it's time for us to leave. But you know, as those boys walked off, you know what I was hit to the realization of? Those two boys are a member of a religious cult where the majority of teenage boys and girls after high school go on a mission for two years in a foreign country, listen to me, largely at their own expense and spread a false gospel. I want to ask you, what would you think would happen if Christian independent Baptist teenagers did that? You know, a lost and dying world looks at a cult like the Mormons and they would assume that they have more concern for their souls than people who hold the truth. Folks, Rahab had a concern for her loved ones. How about you tonight? There's some of you, you need to get back to the place where you have a heart like Rahab and you say, Lord, would you please save my father or my mother or my co-workers? I know that here Rahab's talking about physical deliverance, but listen to me, there is a greater deliverance to be given to them all and tonight we need to have her concern. But the last thing that I want to show you tonight is her crown. And with that, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 1 as I close. We've talked about her past, and that's a lot of the rags, but I want to end by talking about the riches. In just a moment, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. But before I do, I want to tell you what I'm trying to illustrate to you this evening. Rahab was a woman who was misguided in her view of herself and was just a token before men. She was used of men for their pleasure and she disregarded God's design. She disregarded God's plan for her life and just lived the way that she wanted in the flesh. And I'm telling you, she, she, she did much damage in her life. But can I tell you, after she met God... And she placed her faith in him. 
God did some things for her that she would have never imagined. Now this part of the message is not to say, well, just go presume on God, live any way that you want, and uh, God will just bless you threefold at the end. That's not what I'm saying, but there may be some tonight, maybe before you got saved, you live a life, you did things that you were ashamed of. You say, preacher, I'm going to tell you, I am so ashamed of what I did. I'm not here to pile on your shame and your guilt. I'm here to remind you tonight that you're forgiven, and what you can do is go forward believing God, and you let God do things in your life that you could have never done. Notice with me Matthew chapter 1, verse number 5. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. Now let's stop there for just a second. I know we're reading a genealogy. Some of you say, we're in that begat section. I know what that's like. First Chronicles, begat, 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 begat. But in Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. You know, that, that part of the verse tells us one thing. Here was a woman who was used by men and now after she puts her faith in God, she gets a husband. She figures out, oh, this is what God designed. She goes from not knowing who she's going to see from one day to next. And I hear a man who loves her. Here is a man who is committed to her. And then she has a child on top of that. You could stop there and say, man, isn't that wonderful? Here's a woman who never knew what a Christian home was like. And now, guess what? Not only does she have a husband, now she has a child. But it didn't stop there. Because in the very next phrase, it says, And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Hey, not only did she have a child, guess what? She had grandchildren. Some of you grandparents have smirks on your faces. You've made that statement. Boy, if I knew grandchildren were so fun, I'd have had them first. You're like, grandchildren. Boy, that's great. Not only does Ruth have children, then she has grandchildren, and then on top of that, the next phrase, and Obed begat Jesse. Now she has a great-grandson. I had a, pre uh, a gentleman come by me the other day, and he said, you know, you're talking, I wasn't preaching this message, I was talking about something else, but he said, you're talking about grandparents and their grandchildren. He said, well, let me correct you. He said, I'll tell you something that's better than grandchildren. He said, that's great grandchildren. And then he looked at me and he said, and if I can just live another couple of years, I may see my great, great grandchild. I'm going to tell you, he was proud of that. I don't think he was 100, but he must have been getting close. <laughs> Let me rehearse for you what's happened. Rahab gets married. She has a child. She has a grandson. She has a great-grandson. But here's the thing that I want you to see. that in, After Jesse, it says, And Jesse begat David... The king. You want to know who that great, great grandson was? The great, great grandson was King David. It had to blow her mind. I, you say, did she even know that it was King David? She might have been dead by then, but here's the thing that I don't want you to miss. You say, preacher, I've made some mistakes in my life and I've ruined a lot of things and then I come to know the Lord and I get saved and the devil beats you up every day and he reminds you of your past. Listen to me. You stop listening to the accuser of the brethren and follow God and you have no idea what God may do in your future. You know, we like to brag on our children. We like to brag on our grandchildren. If Ruth had been alive when David was born and she had lived another 20 years to see the promise given to him, she'd say, now let me tell you about that great, great grandson of mine. Oh, he's just not an ordinary kid. One day he's going to be the king. But you know what's even better than that? A long time later one greater than David would come. His name, Jesus. 
You say, well, I'm going to tell you, a woman lived like that. She has no right to be in the bloodline of Jesus. I would say keep your opinion to yourself. And you know what you call that? You call it grace. I'm going to tell you, if there's ever been a woman who was taken from rags to riches, it was Rahab. And my friend, you'd do well tonight to know in your heart that you've been taken from the rags of sin to the riches of His grace. And Christian, learn from the life of Rahab. Do a lot with the light that you have and have a concern for your family. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed. I want to ask you these questions. Listen carefully and we'll be done. I wonder how many of you tonight would say this. You would say, Brother Beal, there was a time in my life when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And tonight, I know that I've been taken from rags to riches and that there was a time in my life that I trusted Christ as my Savior. I know that my sins are forgiven. And tonight, I know that I am a child of God. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I can give you a Bible reason why I know I'm saved. If you can say that tonight, would you slip your hand up and keep it up just a moment? Slip it up and keep it up just a moment. All right, thank you. You may put them down. I wonder, is there a soul here tonight? You'd say, you know what, Brother Bill? Or you'd say, Preacher, I'm here tonight. And I'm either not sure or I know that I'm not saved. You may be living in the grave clothes of religion. You may be here this evening and you know that you've played a game, but you know that tonight, even though you may look the part, you'd say, tonight... Preacher, my need is to be saved. You'd say, Preacher, I'm here this evening. I'm either not sure or I know that I'm not saved. God's dealing in my heart. Would you please pray for me this evening? If that's you, would you slip your hand up long enough for me to see it? You can put it right back down. You're here tonight. You'd say, Preacher, would you pray for me? I'm either not sure or I know that I'm not saved. Just one other thing that I would mention to you by way of invitation tonight. I wonder if there's some of you here this evening and you'd say, Brother Beal, tonight you talked about Rahab's concern for her loved ones. I wonder if there'd be some here this evening, you'd say, Brother Beal, I know I'm saved. But Rahab had more concern for her family in Joshua chapter 2 than I've had for mine in recent days. And you'd say, it's been a while since I've really had a concern for my loved ones, for my neighbors, my co-workers. And you'd say tonight, God has challenged my heart by the example of Rahab, and you'd say he's pointed out to me that I've lost my concern for loved ones and tonight. I need to regain that. You'd say, preacher, would you please pray for me? If that's you, would you slip your hand up tonight? Are there several like that? God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. You've heard much preaching this evening about the cross. And tonight you've seen an example of God's grace. In a moment, I'm just going to invite you to stand. I'm going to pray. And we're going to give a time of invitation. It may be that you need to submit as Jesus did. Christian, it may be that tonight your love for Him needs to be rekindled afresh and anew. Before you leave, would you respond to the working of the Holy Spirit? If you're able, would you join me in standing? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you join me in standing tonight? Father... I pray that you'd rekindle the flames of our love for you in our hearts. I pray that tonight we'd be challenged by the example of Rahab. And before we leave this place, may we bow our knee and may we bow our hearts in submission to the work of the Holy Spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. As our musicians begin to play the song of invitation, I want to give you that invitation tonight to pray for your loved ones. You say this evening,